Thanks for being here today. I'm Nate Eaton, and we are talking with the president of Idaho State University, Kevin Satterley. I almost said the new president, but you're not too new anymore. About a year and a half now? About that, yeah. What would you say is the main thing you've learned over the uh, past year and a half? I think one of the main things that I've learned has been fantastic is that Idaho State University has a, a basic student-centric culture in our faculty. Um, I hear that from students constantly, which is great to build from. When the students feel that their faculty care, you can do so much with that and build on that. And then I was really pleasantly surprised, um, even with all the research that I've done, to realize that the breadth of our programming at Idaho State. So most people don't know this, but Idaho State University offers the most uh, certificate and degree programs of any higher education institution in the entire state. We have the most. Mm -hmm. So what that means for our students is uh, they get the most choice. So a student who comes to Idaho State can choose so many different paths to try to better their life through education. And that's a real student-centric model that I really like. And so taking that, we can build some great things. And I deserve no credit for that. That was all in place when I got here, and that's been, that's been great. And you would think, oh, Boise State probably has the most. But mm -hmm. in reality, it's ISU and Pocatello. It is, yeah. So uh, you've done a lot. Really kind of hit the ground running when you, when you took over, or at least from, from the research I've been able to find, uh, which is common. You, you made some changes in your administration, which is mm -hmm. common when new presidents come in. And you got rid of the athletic director. and and said that the goal for that was to improve the athletic program. Right. How has that improved over the past 18 months? Yeah, I think it's moving in exactly the right direction. So for me, athletics, the reason uh, universities have, have athletics programs is to open up a window to the university to provide uh, a place for uh, alum students, alumni, constituents in the community to have a place to have that entertainment, to watch those sports and interface with the university and then to allow those student athletes a place to do what they do so well. So if you want to do that right, you have to make a commitment to doing that right and doing it right all the time. And that's what we're instilling in that program. So our new athletic director, Pauline Theros, has come in. We're both operating on that philosophy that those changes are designed to do the right thing and do the right thing all the time. And when you do that, you'll start program building and you will build a very successful program. And um, we've hired a series of new coaches who are in that program forming stages based on those philosophies. And if you build on that philosophy, the wins will come because you're, you're doing the right by your student athletes, you're treating them right, you're telling the public we're gonna have a quality program that we can all be proud of, that the entire Bengal community can be proud of what's going on in that program. And that's how you build a program long term for the future. When you came into office, is there uh, something that you recognized or, or knew that, yeah, this is the, not the, I don't want to say the biggest problem, but the mm -hmm. biggest issue that needed to be addressed? Or did you kind of come in and say, these are the areas of focus that I want to tackle this, 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 and this? That's probably a combination of both. Some of it were, here's clearly some issues. Um, on a big picture and then there are these smaller tactical issues we have to change along the way. If I have to talk about the larger one, it's, it's talking about how as an institution we've had enrollment declines, we've had some research productivity declines over the last few years, some budget changes that were not positive. So we have to turn all those philosophically and say we are turning those in a positive direction and the next question is how. So working on that culture of, yes, we can do these things and, and dedicating ourselves to it is important. But sometimes it's small things. It's not big things. Small things done well over time can yield great results. For example, and I'll just, this is a very micro level issue, but um, has big impacts. We talk about our research productivity. Um, when a university gets a, a research grant and works on it, money comes with that that is called indirect cost to pay for what it takes to run a research operation. Right now, our, uh, the way we direct those research indirect costs don't go back into uh, continuing more research. They pay for other things. Well, if we want to invest in our future in our research, we have to turn that switch and allow those resources to help us do more research. So a small change in that can yield those big results over time and turn a research productivity, for example. So it's a combination of both. The big picture things you have to change and then finding those smaller micro level issues and moving them in a positive direction. And you've done some of that. I think you, mm -hmm. you mentioned a few months ago that you want to enhance the research, 
research portfolio at ISU, yep. yet you also mentioned a minute ago about the faculty-student ratio and having that good relationship with faculty. Mm -hmm. Sometimes universities can get caught up too much in the research yeah. and a student never sees their professor, there's an aide coming in, right. but then there's other universities, BYU-Idaho, where they don't do any research mm -hmm. at all. How do you keep that balance so that students still feel connected and tied in and the faculty aren't just solely focused on the research? Exactly, and, it's, and it, that's a fantastic question because it gets to the heart of what good university research does. Good university research is what I call this perfect circle. and I mean, That doesn't mean anything by itself, but think of a faculty member who is out working, uh, creating new knowledge, researching, or working with business and industry trying to solve their problems. When they do that, and they create that new knowledge, or they publish this new paper on what they have discovered in their research, then they bring that back into the classroom and they teach those students that new knowledge and they present that to our students, which creates another generation of people who graduate better prepared to get the jobs because they have that latest skill set that came from that research with business and industry. Then those students are ready to graduate and be the best prepared to be hired, be the best prepared to be employable upon graduation, and then they go back and they work in those same fields where their faculty are doing research where they're the best prepared students because of that research. And if you tie it together in that circle, Students don't feel like their faculty is just out doing research in the abstract. They're actually bringing in knowledge that's helping those students be more employable, and those students do the research with them. They're, they work as the research lab assistants. They're doing that even at the undergraduate level. And when you build that circle and that cycle starts to become uh, self-perpetuating, that's how you build a research culture that's a healthy one. Not because somebody said you have to do research or you, this is necessary, because that's how you build that better learning environment for the students. That's our goal. Of course, it's all about the people, getting the right people, getting good people. Is that a challenge to get good professors and academia type to come to Pocatello, Idaho? You know, um, so far everywhere that I've worked in higher education, one of the biggest challenges is how do we attract the right talent? Um, we actually, when we do our searches, we get good talented people and finding the right ones that'll be a fit for us is always a challenge. I don't think it's, um, it's a, something that we have a significant undertaking um, other than it, the same challenge as it always is to get good talent. One of the things I've noticed is you send out a, is it a weekly letter? Um, usually mon monthly. Monthly letter, okay. I, somehow I got on the list, I get your letters. Okay. And you also, th 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 there's been some uh, disturbing instances, not a lot, but some international students targeted, mm -hmm. uh, where you've actually come out and addressed it yourself, you know, mm -hmm. not through a, a PR flag, but, but you. Um, you've spoken about having a, an environment of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Have international student numbers dropped because of those incidents you know, a year or two ago, and, and how do you plan to try to get those back up? Well, we've had a drop in international students. I don't know whether it's because of any particular incident or not, but let me talk to incidents first, and then I'll talk sure. about international students in general. When we had the incident that happened on campus, I wanted to make sure I came out immediately and personally and talked about that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. Uh, in any organization to have people feel like they're being targeted. That's not how you build an organization based on trust, uh, based on stability and hope for their future when anyone is going to feel targeted. So I wanted to make sure we said that is not what we stand for as a university. And so that's why I came out personally and I would do so again because that type of targeted hatred doesn't belong anywhere. Um, we've had a drop in international students at Idaho State but um, uh, a few years ago, Idaho State, like many universities across the country, received a lot of students, in particular from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And back then, the Saudi and the Kuwaiti cultural missions were actively bringing students from those countries to the United States all over the country, and they were paying for those students to go to school. And about four and a half years ago, the Saudi and Kuwaiti cultural missions ended that program, so we're not going to send those students anymore. And what they did is that all students who were in currently, if you were a freshman or a sophomore, you got to continue until you graduated, but they didn't put any more students in. No new students came to replace them. So across the country, universities saw a huge decline in international students when their host countries were no longer paying them to come here. And so we've had that as a big decline in our international student numbers, which means if you look overall at our international student numbers, 
our numbers now are about the same they were before that program started. Mm. It's just that in between them, it spiked when that program was going on and now it's dropping off. But if you look at 10 years ago to now, we actually have a similar number of international students. That doesn't mean that's the number we want it to be, but because I think our entire community is enhanced when we bring cultural perspectives. So we want to increase that, but I think that's one of the major causes of what we have seen happen. Sure, not necessarily specific instances that happen on campus or near campus. Well, I hope not. Yeah. But I can't say that hasn't or that it didn't impact individual students. Um, one of the things, though, about increasing internationalization at a university and that culture is you can't do it for the money. You can't say, we want these students because they pay more because they're international students. You have to do it. If, you, if you're going to do it, you have to say, we are going to invest in the right getting the right positives out of that cultural exchange, that we want them here because of the cultural exchange to broaden people's viewpoint of the world and their horizon. And if you make a commitment to doing that right, what it really means is you have to take that extra revenue that those students bring in and put them into the right types of programs so that you, everyone gets value out of that. Yeah. And that's gotta be the commitment. Tell me about the Idaho State ROAR campaign. As I said, sort of at the beginning of our discussion, Nate, um, Idaho State University has a lot of great things going for it. I, since I got here, I've discovered there were so many great things going on. You know, pick any of the examples I gave in my early speeches about, you know, there's, there's over 4,000 colleges and universities in the United, in the United States, over 4,000, but only 334 of those are classified by the Carnegie Foundation as research universities. So that's less than 10% of the universities in the country are on that list, and Idaho State is one of them. That puts us in a great category. But the problem is nobody knew that, <laughs> right? Nobody knew that we offered that breadth of programming that students could come to, you know? And, and so what I decided early on is we have to talk about who we are. Be proud of who we are. Be proud of these people who came before us who built a fantastic university. So we decided we needed a statewide marketing and an ad campaign to talk about who we are to get students to open their eyes to Idaho State, to see that we're there and what we have to offer. Because a student can't come here and be part of the research, for example, we do with the Idaho National Lab and those collaborations if they don't know that exists. A student won't come here to be a nuclear engineer if they don't know we have that program. You know, we have for one of only six accredited nuclear engineering programs west of the Mississippi, but if students don't know that, they won't come. So we sat down and we designed um, a marketing campaign around the theme of who we are, what we do well, and centered around the concept of that's our roar. Uh, that's what it means to roar and be a Bengal. And we built this program. And so far, I think it's been quite successful. Yeah, sometimes it feels like we're in Idaho Falls, that there's like a wall between Idaho Falls and Pocatello. Yeah, that yeah. there's this disconnect when it's really 40, 45 minutes away, and, and you don't realize that there is this university with resources and mm -hmm. talented staff and students that you can rely on. So spreading the message not only to eastern Idaho, but statewide. Have you seen any results from that? It's kind of early, I know. But have you seen any residual come back? It is early because we actually rolled out the campaign because it took a while to design and get yeah. it ready. We rolled it out late last spring. And by late spring, most students have already made college choice. So it's going to take another cycle to see how, the, how that impacts us. What I do know is this. I've been hearing from our alumni around the state how much they love the campaign. I've been hearing from people who previously had no connection with the university who now are wanting to build a connection because they've seen what we've had. In our, in our campaign, so I think that is important in, in our brand image. Um, now this is completely anecdotal and I can't make any promises to any of your viewers right now, but we had our fall recruiting event for students that we do for uh, students who are seniors in high school. We do a, a recruiting event in the fall and one in the spring. So we did our fall one, which is our first one after this campaign has launched. And um, we did it in the ballroom on campus and we ran out of chairs. So, hmm. is that a sign that this is, this is working? Don't know yet, but it feels like a positive that this is moving in the right direction. Definitely a step, yeah. Uh, a lot of talk about the rising cost of education mm -hmm. and people can't afford to go to college, they can't afford to go to university. ISU is much more affordable than other universities, but how, how do you fix that problem or at least address that problem of the skyrocketing cost of mm -hmm. higher ed? Um, I, 
That's a national problem too. I mean, it's an Idaho sure. problem, but it's also a national problem. And one of the things that has happened over the course of 30 years, it's a, it's a 30 year slow building problem, is that as states around the country have decreased their percentage of their budget they put into higher education, um, there's a directly correlating increase in tuition. If you look at the whole percentage of the state's budget, the state of Idaho's budget that is spent on higher education, it's about the same percentage that it was 30 years ago. It's that 30 years ago, 90% of that was supplied by the state and 10% by the students. And now it's about 50-50. Mm -hmm. But it's about the same amount of money percentage-wise of the state budget that's being spent, it's whether the source is tuition or the state's general fund. So that's a, uh, that's a problem, and it's not one that I blame the legislature for. And the legislature is doing the best they can with the resources available. They have lots of needs. They're doing a good job. And, and Idaho is being treated much better than many other states by our legislature. So the key is now how do we combat that? So at Idaho State, one of the things that we've done, again, I take no credit for this. This was before I got here, but we are continuing this program. We have a tuition lock program. So when you enter as a freshman at Idaho State University, if you maintain your on path towards a degree and you meet your requirements, you pay the same tuition all four years. Hmm. It doesn't go up during the time that you're there. And every incoming new freshman is eligible for that program. You don't have to do anything to apply. You're eligible when you come in. Hmm. So if you can stay on track towards a degree, um, you can be eligible for that program. So that's one of the ways we're trying to combat it. Yeah. The other way is we're trying to hold costs down. We're trying to say, what can we do to not spend more than we need to? And only look at student fee increases as a last resort. That that's not our preferred fund source. That we do that only when we have to. So we're trying to be good stewards of the money and trying to do right by our students. At the same time, ensuring we have the resources to provide that quality education that helps students better their lives. Because that's our goal. Yeah. So you moved here from Boise, mm -hmm. and how has the transition been? Good, good. Yeah. I mean, uh, Pocatello and Eastern Idaho is very friendly, very friendly. I mean, I'm an Idaho native, so I've lived in um, small towns and cities in Idaho, uh, and Idahoans are generally friendly, but I have found that the people here in this part of the state have been very welcoming, very friendly, and uh, enjoy it. Tell us a little bit about your your, your personal life as much as you want to, your family, and, mm -hmm. and how they've adjusted to moving to Pocatello? I think it's gone pretty well. Um, my daughter really likes going to school here. Um, she's having a good time in her school, and uh, we've, we've taken advantage of the region, you know, trips into Yellowstone and into the Tetons and some of the great fly fishing places that are around this part of the state, and, you know, we enjoy outdoor recreation, which Eastern Idaho is a fantastic place for outdoor recreation. Um, it's, uh, I, I like the climate, and it's you know, not as hot as the Treasure Valley is in the summers, and uh, it's got nice winters. I actually like snow. Mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in the very northern part of the state, and our winters were longer and snowier, and that's what I've discovered they are here, and I actually like that. Yeah. So I think we're doing pretty well. How many orange ties did you have to buy when you <laughs> took the job? Uh, three, I think. Three, so yeah. you just rotate every uh. third day. No. <laughs> uh, when you were growing up, did you ever say, hey, I want to be the president of a university? No, I didn't. And how does one become the president of a university? I mean, well, for me, my career path isn't traditional for a university president. You know, I was never a faculty member. I didn't work my way up from faculty member to department chair to dean, uh, which is the traditional path. So for me, um, after my undergraduate, I went to law school. And I'm a lawyer by trade, and then I worked in private practice for a while, and then for the attorney general's office, and then eventually, while I was in the attorney general's office, I was assigned as the chief legal counsel for the State Board of Education in Idaho, and that's how I ended up getting into education work. What I didn't realize when I started, but became evident after, was how education is a calling for me. Um, so, neither of my parents went to college, so I'm a first generation college graduate. I've seen firsthand the opportunities that a college education opens for people, how it provides that path. And 
started using my law degree to help advance Idaho's higher education mission was really a calling for me. And then I spent the next 20 years working in our higher education system. And, and uh, when this position came open and I thought I might be able to come over and help, might be able to continue helping kids from Idaho get an education, that's what I wanted to do. Where do you foresee ISU in five, ten years when it's time to, for you to move on to, to becoming something else? What, what, what do you want to accomplish? Well, um, I haven't even thought about the move sure, on. Sure, you right? are there's, yeah. There's a, lot, there's a lot for us to work on here. Y yeah. What I want us to do every day is get a little bit better every day. I mean, one, I think one of the roles of a university president is to talk about continuous improvement. Idaho State University is a great place already before I ever got here. It is. And my job, I think, is to make us want to get a little bit better each day. So what will we look like in five years or in ten years? We will have hopefully turned the corner on some of these thing, issues that have nipped at our heels for a while and we're moving them in a positive direction. That we've worked on our student retention and enrollment. Because student retention is the key to so much of our success. When a student from Idaho comes in and wants to get into higher education, our job is to help them get there, help them be successful. And if for any reason, whatever the reason is, finance, personal, uh, grade related, career objectives, work, if for any reason once they start they stop out and don't come back, that's not okay. We want them to finish. We want them to complete. So that student success metric is probably the primary thing that we want to turn um, and, and, uh, and move the needle on. All righty. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. This has been uh, Kevin Satterley. He's the president of Idaho State University. Thank you for watching. Have a good week.